Britain is entering its first atheist age, according to a new study. They found that parents are failing to pass on religious beliefs to their children. I think the better explanation here is they're failing to show that it is real in their lives for their children to see. You see, your children watch everything that you do. They see whether what you say is true and whether you practice what you truly believe. Is there a conviction? And if you don't have a true, alive relationship with God, your kids will see it as a ritual and a pointless process and they will move away from it, rightfully so. But if they see a live, vibrant, powerful display of a true relationship with God and they see the power and the movement of God, there is nothing to question. Your kids know that God is real and they need a relationship with Him and they will get to that point and they themselves will have a relationship with God. This is what is lacking at the moment. So for the first time in history, the UK now has more atheists than people who believe in the existence of a God, according to researchers. The three-year project involved several universities across the UK. It included surveys of nearly 25,000 people across six countries, Brazil, China, Denmark, Japan, the UK and the USA to find out why people are becoming atheists and agnostic. Little hint, Lucifer is behind this. Figures from 2008 showed 41.8% of Brightons believed in God, while 35.2% did not. Within a decade, by 2018, this had reversed with 35.2% believing and 42.9% not believing. Now, what's incredibly, and that's why I'm sharing this article with you as well, what's incredibly sad for me is if you are a history buff and you go back in history, you'll know that in World War II, the UK was pretty much seen as a Christian country. They prayed. They called out on God when they were being attacked by the Luftwaffe. And they have multiple accounts of miracles taking place at that time. There's stories of where they only had three or four Spitfires or Hurricanes to launch against waves of Luftwaffe planes coming to attack the UK. And the enemy would be routed. They would break formation, turn and flee from these minor numbers of planes coming against them. And when they interrogated these pilots that were shot down, they said, what do you mean? The sky was filled with British fighter planes. Miraculous events as God intervened and provided cover and protection for them in that situation as they called on the name of the Lord. Now from that godly nation to what we're seeing now, and I'm not even talking about the influence of the migrant infiltration in the UK, we now see this situation, which unfortunately is the perfect setup for them to accept and walk blindly into the arms of Antichrist when his moment on the world stage arrives. It's truly, truly sad. So to give you an example, and bear with me, there's a beautiful book I've got called The Mighty Hand of God, written by Catherine Pollard Carter. And she's collected stories supernatural encounters of God intervening in the times of war and things that happen. And I'm going to read you one which relates to the story about the UK. So bear with me. Something supernatural confronted invader planes. At a crucial moment in British history, deep in the underground operations room of the 11th Group Fighter Command on a Sunday morning in September 1940, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill and his military advisors sat watching the lights on the electrical battle charts. Because of the demolitions during the previous retreat to Dunkirk, the British were dangerously short of defensive materials. In all of England, there were only 518 pound guns, many of them stripped from museums with which they could repel an advancing army. They were equally short of all other defense materials. Intelligence reports from the continent clearly indicated invasion of England by the enemy under preparation. 
As early as July, Hitler had ordered his Luftwaffe to begin shooting Royal Air Force planes out of the sky to make air defense of the British Isles ineffective, if not impossible. This had been a difficult job because the Royal Air Force had fought furiously and shot down 164 Nazi bombers that month with the loss of only 58 of their own. In August, despite insufficient sleep and rest, the outnumbered British downed 662 Nazi bombers while losing only 360 of their own. Even though the Royal Air Force continued to inflict heavy losses on the inexhaustible supply of enemy aircraft, the men watching the electrical charts in the underground operations room knew the scores could change. They knew the capacity of the Nazi wartime factories had been increased to produce more modern planes and faster than the British could. <coughs> England needed a miracle <coughs> and it needed it soon. As Churchill watched on that momentous September Sunday, a suddenly alert showed more than 40 aircraft approaching from the French seaport deeper. More than 40. Another 60 from another front and in another 80 approaching in one unit from another. As each Nazi formation neared the English coast, a British squadron would rise to meet it. Since there were only 25 squadrons assigned to the 11th Fighter Command defending southern England, all of them were in the air. Tension grew in the shelter. Air Vice Marshal Keith R. Park requested reinforcements from Stanmore to the north, but they could only spare three squadrons. What other resources have we got, Churchill asked. None, was the reply. The odds were great, the margins small, the stakes infinite, Churchill wrote. Then, inexplicably, the discs on the wall chart began to move eastward. The great Nazi air flotilla had turned back. With 185 of their aircraft downed in flames, they were in retreat. Miraculously, against all logistical probability, the Royal Air Force had won the battle. Why Royal Air Force pilots continued to win against unbelievable odds may or may not be satisfactorily explained in the records. But British intelligence officers received strange information from three different members of the Nazi armed forces. One from a Nazi pilot captured after his crippled plane was downed. Why did your formation retreat when only two planes were attacking you? Two, said the pilot. There were hundreds. After the prisoner was dismissed, the British intelligence officers exchanged puzzled glances. They all but dismissed the reply until a Luftwaffe officer captured Leicester asked them in perplexity, Where did you get all the planes you threw into the battle over Britain? His British interrogators managed to mask their surprise. The powerful Nazi bomber force had been met by a handful of little outmoded Royal Air Force Spitfire and Hurricane fighters. No sky full of Royal Air Force planes. Only dog-tired pilots making anywhere from their third to their seventh mission that day had risen to meet the bombers. Perhaps visionary planes rode the skies in formation with the Royal Air Force that day. Perhaps only the Nazis could see those planes. It was the remarks of the imprisoned Nazi intelligence officers captured still later that came nearest to disclosing the divine source of the plane-filled mirages. With the striking of your Big Ben clock each evening at nine, the Nazi told the British intelligence officer, you used... A secret weapon which we did not understand. It was very powerful and we had no countermeasures against it. He was right. There was a powerful force set in motion each evening as Big Ben struck nine. It was the powerful force of a nation in heartfelt prayer against which no countermeasure could hope to prevail. A nation in prayer to the omnipotent God of creation each evening as Big Ben in the clock tower of the Parliament building struck nine, the people of the British Isles of the far-flung English Commonwealth halted for the silent moment of prayer. Inspiration for the silent moment of prayer had come from the prominent industrialist W. Tudor Pohl as a result of conversion years earlier with a soldier buddy in World War I. As Pohl and his friend chatted in the mouth of a cave near Jerusalem on the eve of battle, a moment of silence fell, 
And Paul's young companion turned to him and said, I shall not come through the struggle like thousands of others. It will be my destiny to go on now. You will survive. You will live to see a greater and more vital conflict fought on every continent, on every ocean and in the sky. Paul's friend continued with a plea for a spiritual response from all those who fight in that future war. He stressed the power of silence and urged a moment of silence each day. Then he said, when those tragic days arrive, do not forget us. The next day, as he predicted, the young man was killed in battle. And then Paul implemented this silent moment of prayer with Big Ben. And miracles happened. That's just one of many, many stories in books like this of a time when the UK was a powerful, God-fearing, praying nation and the difference it made. Now the UK is stressed and worrying about being obliterated, annihilated, removed, destroyed, but at the same time has entered an atheistic, agnostic age turning away from God. If they would just look back on their history and turn back to the one true God, what a most powerful divine difference that would make. God bless. Keep looking up. Shalom.